as you know, we are going to solve uh, financial institutions' compliance problems uh, with RegTech solutions in 20 minutes. So I think that's a very, very nice, ambitious thing we have to do. Um, before we're going to do that, I really would like to um, welcome Chai and Michelle. These are uh, very prestigious recnopreneurs. And um, the first question I would have for them is, can you please explain maybe a little bit about how uh, you came about to become actually a recnopreneur? Chai? Uh, I'll go first. Hi, uh, my name is Chai Kid. So um, I am the uh, co-founder and uh, managing director of a RecTech 100 company, Synopsys uh, Solutions. At the same time, I've also just founded uh, um, a, a crypto-centric uh, KYC utility company, Trace2.io, um, to provide uh, KYC solutions to the crypto community. Now, um, in respect of uh, how I founded uh, or, or we founded Synopsys and how we come about doing this, this piece of work here, is that we, my background is actually compliance. I spent um, 15 years in, in banks compliance, uh, last regional head of compliance uh, for an Australian bank. And prior to that, I was an auditor. So um, with all the interaction that we have with uh, clients and with, uh, with banks themselves, we realized that there's a lot of uh, inefficiency, there's a lot of manual process, there's a lot of um, work that has been piled upon the compliance function as well as the business themselves, uh, so much so that a lot of things doesn't really move, right? Um, so that, that's, and no one is happy. With the increase in regulation, um, the, the happiness and efficiency goes down. So uh, we want to be able to try and help that space uh, to, to solve that problem with our regulatory knowledge and try to use technology to be able to overcome some of these hurdles by uh, hopefully starting with automating the manual and digitizing the analog and eventually you know, going into the, the, uh, the, the tokenization space as well. So that, that's our, my, my journey. Um, I leave it to, to Michelle to, to share with you her story. Yeah, thanks. I think we ended up in the reg tech space in a very different way than you did, in the sense that you came from the compliance area, and as a subject matter expert, you saw how you could fix things. In our case, we frankly never intended to be in reg tech. It was never, even, in, even maybe nine months ago, it wasn't in our corporate vision or in terms of our product rollout. And I think something that happened is that uh, the international bodies were, are putting pressure on the regulators for various things, as you know, and the regulators actually came to us. So it all started with uh, an ASEAN regulator who is themselves under pressure saying, can you help us? And what we have done over the years in the past is we do simulation training, so we use uh, a huge simulation engine, so we generate virtual lending portfolios, like a flight simulator for lending, and we train people. So we do, we've done that for years, and that's kind of our thing. It never occurred to us to try to simulate anti-money laundering or some of the things we're seeing in compliance because we figured the big legacy companies had it locked up, and you know, it's a space that we figured you couldn't really break into unless you were part of the the legacy uh, large corporate global vendors. And the regulators really pushed us. So I think it's, it's notable. So I suspect in terms of entrepreneurs and how they got into this, we probably represent two of the main camps. Like you come from the subject matter expert side or you get dragged into it. As a, so some of the AI and machine learning guys maybe never set out to be focused on reg tech. They wanted to do cool data stuff and then they realized that there were a lot of problems to be solved. So it wasn't coincidence then, eh? Yeah. Um, yeah so um, let's, let's, let's talk about a little bit about, you know, the, the, the issues uh, compliance, ha uh, compliance personnel has in banks. I mean, um, we did some research recently and um, we've seen that, you know, 300 billion US dollar has been spent on fines um, uh, by banks uh, since the financial crisis. And um, I think Thomson Reuters actually did some research where they said that um, every 10 minutes there is a change in regulation. So, in a way, I mean, if we talk about issues, 
there, there will be loads of issues. But we don't have that much time, so let's just talk a little bit about what the majority of the biggest issues are within banks. I mean, and, and I'm, let's, let's make it a little bit broader. Let's not talk only about banks. Let's just talk about the regulatory regime and where are those big issues? What are the most big issues? I think I was just listening to the earlier panel uh, and then we were talking about cryptocurrency. I thought I'd make that reference because you, you uh, Mona, you mentioned about uh, $320 yeah. billion dollars that is spent um, uh, on bank, uh, by banks trying to fix the compliance or the regulatory problem. Um, and just coincidentally, if you are following cryptocurrency space, the entire market cap <laughs> is only less than 320 billion today. So you have banks spending 320 billion dollar on compliance problem and then versus the same amount of money which is actually the entire market cap of cryptocurrency. And people are saying that cryptocurrency is, is a bubble, it's gonna burst, but you know, you have banks throwing away money, you know, in the compliance space. So how do you reconcile these two? That, that's number one point. Um, so it, it, um, having come from a compliance background and um, I, I do um, on a part-time basis teach compliance officers how to be compliance officers, um, you know, with, with via an organization called ICTA. So um, I, I think that, that in terms of the types of problems that banks or larger institutions face as a, as a whole, uh, it, it's quite um, long drawn, right? There's lots of legacy uh, controls that has been added on to um, various uh, operational processes, if you like, over time because, you know, this regulation is tweaked. Um, um, say two years ago and then the auditor or the regulator comes in with an internal audit point and they have to tweak and add in another control mechanism into that um, that, that risk area. So these, uh, are, I would say, were, were added on over time and therefore it comes to the point whereby um, uh, and as well as uh, uh, with, um, say, for example, a more international bank, they will be uh, acquiring systems um, over the years, and a lot of these enterprise systems are acquired, and they are not very cheap. They are pretty expensive, and usually have like a lifetime of say five years or so, you know, as a contract uh, uh, basis. So you ended up with being stuck with a legacy system that is may not be able to be fit for purpose for everybody, and uh, you do have an increasing um, demand to uh, be more efficient in the work that you need to do and some of these problems uh, actually exacerbate by itself just because of the, the sheer number of regulations that has been thrown at the organization and as well as a legacy system that has been set to be used um, over the years but doesn't really uh, solve everything uh, for the future. So I think these all adds together to create that overall problem and it's very, very difficult for large banks to get out of it and say let's press the reset button and redo all these again. It's not going to happen. So from my perspective, which is why we service the smaller enterprise, the smaller uh, startups, fintech startups, the crypto startups, because I think they do have a chance to start this journey without any legacy issues that are being faced by the bank. And it, it makes better sense for me. Mona, I think when we look at the, the industry issues, in my mind, I think of it in kind of three categories. First, there's the, the automation piece, right? To Julia's point, you know, every 10 minutes, there's a new regulation. That is a stunning factoid. Thank you for that one. Um, you know, there's just the automation collapse or cost, which everybody's doing. And I think if you work in a bank, that's, that should be a relatively easy win. Get some runs on the board, reduce your staff, all that. It seems like kind of a no-brainer. You just have to deal with the usual challenges of, of replacing some legacy systems. So check, job done. The second, which I think if you talk about big problems to solve, yeah. what we're seeing is, I'll, call, I'll just call it network analysis. So all the issues around the, the blockages and hurdles to sharing a lot of unstructured data across organizations and all the private blah, blah, blah. So we all know that that's a huge issue and nobody's gonna solve that anytime soon. However, within the banks, we can, obviously everybody's, it's not just machine learning, but really moving to a deeper uh, network analysis of the data. And I think that will be a huge, interesting problem to solve for a long time. The third category that we're tackling is the people piece. And I think they fit together because as you 
can finally start to leverage the unstructured data to find those insights into the network analysis and see new patterns and uncover them quickly in real time, you need to take that and push it out to the people on the front line. You need to push it out to the compliance officers. So if you can, I think, connect all those dots, you can win. I think if I can add on yeah. that, because you mentioned about people, I, I think that the mentality is actually quite important here. Because if, if I'm putting myself back, you know, in the past, if I'm running a, a large compliance team, for example, if I have like, say, 100 people, you know, and, I, and then there's this great solutions out there, and then maybe it costs a quarter million. So I do have to justify that if I spend or get the business budget to spend this quarter million dollars, so how many hate counts am I going to cut? Mm -hmm. Today, it's a realistic question. It's not like you can keep your 100 hit count and you still can spend the $250,000. It doesn't work like that in, in real life, right? Uh, unless you, your, your bank have got bottomless uh, pit, you know, in terms of budget, which is quite hard these days. Um, although I hear that compliance people still get a lot of bonus still. Huh? So, <laughs> <laughs> so that's a slightly different thing. Depends where you work, I guess. Yeah. So, so I think um, that, that part is, is, a, is a mentality question that uh, c compliance hates or even the technology hates needs to, needs to grapple with. And how do you actually change that? Because if you end up having to bring in this uh, uh, quarter million solution, or maybe for less than that, and you have to demonstrate that your efficiency is going to go up and somehow your, your, your resources and your team is going to come down in terms of the hit count. Yeah. So if you can get over that point, you know, then maybe you will take a first step out to at least embrace and explore what solutions is suitable for you. Yeah, I think... It's I think you bring up a very interesting point that was more or less also what I wanted to go for the next question because the thing is, so you, you, you have a very nice solution, it's more or less end-to-end -end solution. You say, um, I'm, I'm really, you know, I'm trying to sell it in the first place to SMEs, right? And um, whereas, you know, we are here also to look at larger incumbents like big compliance departments who actually have huge issues with regard to all the regulation that comes their way increasingly all the time, like every 10 minutes. So how come do you guys think that although we have all those, all, all those solutions already readily available, I mean, we, we identified 400 companies who actually globally have rec tech solutions in place. How do you think that it, is, it looks like it's still relatively slowly with regard to the adoption of the incumbents to partner up with, for instance, you guys. I think, I think there are two parts to this. As I said, the mentality is one thing because yeah. most of the people want to risk manage their own career, right? They do not want to put their head on a chopping board. That's, that's, a, that's a fact of life. And, and so unless you are, you are as, a, as compliance professional, you will be more risk averse than, than other people. Yeah. Eh? So <laughs> typically, if you have got a, a good role, you've got a good job, you've got a good team, you typically do not want to rock the boat yourself. It's just uh, pretty suicidal in some sense. Right? So the mentality is what I mentioned earlier on. And the second part is actually the, the, the maybe the regulatory uh, or the regulator's mentality and the support of reg tech solutions have to perhaps change because most of the time when we start to talk to some of the bigger organization, the first thing they will say is that, uh, uh, does MAS approve this? Yeah. <laughs> Do you know? I mean, I'm not sure whether any MES or, or people in the, in the audience, but the reality is that these questions get asked all the time. Whether is it in, in Singapore in, in, uh, by prospects as well as in other countries, as the regulators uh, endorse this. And my answer to that is that I'm sorry, but I don't think any regulators in the world will endorse any, any vendors. It's just un, 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 unlikely. Then they will then compare ourselves to the, the incumbent uh, providers. You know, when we talk about, well, we're in the AML space, when we talk about AML, they have to compare uh, with incumbents like, you know, uh, Thomson Roy. Reuters, Dow Jones and the like. So the database company, they are great companies that, that provides uh, a huge amount of uh, um, uh, resources as well as the source, you know, to, to, to check, uh, to screen, you know, to, to manage, to help the organization manage risk. You know, although it's, 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 a, it's a screening database, it does what it's, it's supposed to do. But then where we come in is actually to automate the, the entire process of end-to-end -end onboarding, KYC, risk assessments and all that. Now, so the, the, the adoption um, uh, rate with the bigger banks tends to be a little bit harder because, you know, we, we, we try to talk to some of them, you know, I'm not saying it's, it's not going to work. It's just that in my mind, having worked in banks before, the sales cycle 
for something like that, it's going to be like, what, six to nine months? Yeah, yeah. Now, I'm, I'm a startup and, and I'm not funded by anybody else. So my objective was to generate cash, was to generate sales and we had to hit the road and run. But equally, if I look at the entire financial services sector, banks is just one part of it. There's other smaller FIs, you know, uh, that place in the marketplace as well. And, and these people are faced with the same type of regulatory requirement. In the, in the space of AML. So, you know, if I can target these people and there's a larger pool of potential, ticket size is smaller, then from a business perspective, it makes sense. Yeah. And at the moment, we have about close to 500 uh, B2B clients uh, spending from financial services space to the uh, non-financial services space, uh, which will be your lawyers, your accountants, your corporate secretaries, because they have to comply with AML requirements as well. What about fintechs? Yeah, fintechs as yeah. well, fintechs uh, and, and cryptocurrency clients, right? So we have uh, quite, a, quite a large um, uh, client base in that space. Although I have to, your point about the regulators and not requiring things, we, I, I think there's a part, I don't disagree necessarily, but what we heard in the you industry can. was like this mismatch in the sense that, you know, we talk to a bank and say, Okay, so you guys have your boring e-learning that everybody hates. Why are you doing that? And they'd say, because the regulator said so. And then I'd go talk to the regulator and say, well, the bank said that they're happy with what you're doing, the way you're doing it, so keep doing it that way even though nobody likes it. And the regulator says, no, 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 that's not what we want, right? If you talk to, you know, MAS, you know, David Hardoon, the chief data officer, he says, I want live data feeds. If I can have feeds that told me you know, what people's skills were, where the holes were in understanding the compliance procedures, that would be great, that's what we want. The other ASEAN regulators, the FCA has been very vocal saying that, that we want to, everybody to up their game. So it's like, it's almost like they'll do today what was written on paper last year. Yeah. <laughs> and, the, and I was a regulator. I worked at the International Monetary Fund. I worked at the Federal Reserve Bank. I've been on that side and it's, I'm like, how, you, you're not hearing what the regulators are saying sometimes, right? Because I think because we get into this rule-based, like we program the rules in the system and go, I'm like, I don't I think you guys maybe aren't hearing them. Are they, are they speaking in different language, you think, you know? I, no, and I think, I think you have to give some credit for regulators being some of the ones being the forward-looking ones. The whole, you know, when you're playing soccer, run to the ball is going to be, not where yeah. it is today. <laughs> and there's that lack of anticipation that we're seeing. So sometimes I feel like maybe some of those conversations just aren't as functional or effective in that sense because the compliance guy, right? He's like, what's written on paper today? I'll take that literally and execute that. But it's like, well, guys, you're going to have to be a little more forward-looking if you're going to if you're going to be successful and do a good job in a year or two. Okay, so um, I see that we have quite a few questions from the audience. So I, I let, let's focus on that for a bit because these are very good questions. So one of them is how easy is it for startup uh, rec techs to leverage emerging technology? I think Jade is really one uh, one for I, you. I think I think it should be. Um, I mean, it's not a question of easy or difficult. I, I think it should be um, in the DNA <laughs> of startups um, because it's a tech company. Then it has to be part of uh, what you do and uh, what you how you live and breathe. So uh, and and the the ability for a startup, you know, in the rec tech space to be agile and and to embrace new technology is far far easier and greater than say for example a, a large tech company out there. You know, because they may have lots and lots of uh, limitations uh, about what they can try with, whereas for a rag tech startup like myself, we can do, we can literally do anything. Mm. We can explore anything because we, we, we need the, uh, our people to explore. If we don't explore and, and find the right uh, outcome for the clients, then, you know, we will be left behind. So it, it's... it's it's Should essential. It, shouldn't it be more like a funding issue, maybe? That's, funding? Yeah. Um, well, it's always good to, to have funding, but, but this is my personal view. <laughs> um, it, without, with funding, it comes with a lot, a lot of um, obligations and a lot of responsibility and a lot of, you know, uh, targets that you have to meet because somebody had put in 
a quarter million to you. Yeah. You know, sure, you can hire a lot of people, but that runs out. But I would have thought that as a startup, the, the, as a founder of startups, um, two startups now, you, you do have to make sure that um, you, 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 have a, you have a way to build a product and be able to sell it so that people can pay you the money much much greater than you get funding from someone and the fund is is is, is going to be limited yeah um michelle do you have anything to add to that or shall we go to the next question yeah i think i mean in terms of the question i agree that for us it's easy the key thing is when i that question in terms of leveraging emerging technology i think the key is how much can we take existing things like machine learning, AI, and repurpose them and throw them at RegTech? And I think it's endless. Yeah. And there are actually two more questions which I think you can't almost combine them. So how can big and small players work together to take this ecosystem forward? And that was definitely also a question I had for you guys. So please let us know. Michelle, start with Michelle now. Sure. No, I think I think that actually is the way forward in terms of collaboration. So, for example, uh, you know, small smaller entrepreneurs working with the legacy vendors, which I think you don't necessarily see in other parts of fintech and innovation, right? So, for example, you don't see a little tiny new analytics company going to work with a giant one. But I think in terms of reg tech, there are different angles of opportunity. And then I think, it, and the key thing for RegTech is if you're a small entrepreneur, if you, if you work with an incumbent vendor, it allows you to access their distribution channel, uh, allows also the, the ability to really engage with regulators and large corporates at, at a different level than you might. To, to give you an example of what we do here in, in, in Synopsys, now uh, we definitely partner up with big uh, companies um, just on the technology front um, because we are rag tech, we're a startup, so we are also looking for cost uh, effective and efficient outcome right, for our clients. So we're on the cloud and uh, we don't build our own you know, servers and put it in our own office and all that because that's not going to work. Security wise, going to be a big problem. So we're working with people like uh, Amazon Web Services, you know, so we have got an enterprise contract with Amazon Web Services where we actually make sure that all the clients' deployment are all very, very silo up in each uh, and encrypted within one EC2 or, or, or if you like a virtual machine on its own. So that that ensures the security and the you know it will help our financial services clients to comply with the TRMs. If you're familiar with technology risk management guidelines in Singapore, so that will that will help. So this is one example on the technology front, and then secondly uh, with uh, uh, because we are compliance uh, solutions uh, with a focus on anti-money laundering, so we work with database companies as well. You know, so there's no need, and I, and I stress that you know, if you if anybody out, out there as a rag tech company, I may offend some people here, but I don't really care. Um, if you try to disrupt, say for example, uh, um, the database uh, sector, and say that you can build the world's best database with machine learning today, let's say you start from today. You're not gonna. You're not gonna get anywhere because the reality is that if those news and those research that has been performed over the, over the last fifteen years are no longer in the public domain, how do you crawl it? Yeah. You know, you're gonna start somewhere. Maybe fifteen years later, you get somewhere. But fifteen years later, the incumbent World database company would have gotten much, much further with a rich data source that they already have. So, you know, our approach is never to try and reinvent this part of the wheel. We, we want to work with big players and, and we want to be able to, to ultimately provide the best outcome for our clients to be able to level up their compliance standards with the most cost efficient uh, approach. And it's interesting because um, you're saying we want the best for our clients. So I quickly want to touch upon one thing. Um, so we, the past few days, we all talked about customer experience, right? And especially in banking, how you can, you know, really change the, that the uh, experience of the customer is much better. And when we talk, for instance, about client onboarding, that is in pain for everybody, right? So, and how can you make that process much more automated and much more um, seamlessly? So from that perspective, your solutions, you would say, would really make a big difference, right? I mean, because it is cheap, it is seamless. I would say it's cheap. cheap. It's not a very nice word. You know, the people who say, you know, <laughs> okay. if it's cheap, it must be not good. So I, I, mean I think I would use the word cost-effective. Okay. 
<laughs> effective, okay, efficient. Cost okay, effective, fine. Yes, that's better. But what kind of advice would you want to give, like for instance, somebody who's now in compliance or in risk management within a large uh, bank and or financial institution, and they would like to change their lives because they don't see through, through the tsunami of, of regulation, their lives uh, eh, not so fantastic anymore. What kind of advice would you give them to go about it? Would, should they stay in their work? Should they do something else? Should they become a regnopreneur? Food for thought. I, I would say it depends. Huh? If, 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 there's always two sides to the, to the coins. Huh? If they were to remain as a compliance officer in a bank, which is well, which has bright futures, um, I think, uh, depending on what position you hold. Uh, if you are the one that performs all the very menial tasks, uh, repetitive uh, transaction monitoring tasks, unfortunately, I think this is going to be replaced very soon. Okay, but if you are the more advisory person um, in banks and, and, and FIs, then probably if you, 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 you will have a future. But the future will be more secure if you embrace what's what technology is, is uh, uh, what new technology has come about and try and explore that. I mean, that's within the ambit of what you can do uh, within the bank. Huh? And I, I would suggest to all compliance officers to really think about coming to work every day, um, uh, not as business as usual, but innovate as usual. Right. So if you come into the office and as part of your, your, your compliance job, you think about how you can innovate your processes. Doesn't mean you have to spend a quarter million just to make sure that, you know, if you have to do a screening check, you know, right now, if you are doing this laboriously by printing it out, by, you know, signing your name and proving that you've done the work, is there a better way to do this? Right. This is this is the, what I meant by cost effective. How do you do the time stamping in a more effective manner? But if you're trying to think of, okay, I think I'll have enough of the corporate life. I want to start something new uh, as a startup. Then you do obviously have to uh, uh, be able to leverage off your background and then you must be able to find a tech talent. Uh, and, and unfortunately, tech talent is far and a few in Singapore. Uh, those people who are good uh, have already started something on their own. Michelle, I have a different question for you. So how would you say, is RegTech an, an enabler or a disruptor? Well, definitely it's going to succeed if it's done as an enabler, right? Because we have to build on what we already have. We need to do it in a way that is bringing safety and soundness to the whole system. So I think when you do it that way, it will be a success. And to the point about the career, uh, hopefully enabler, that if you do it that way, it's going to also lead to career enabling, I think. Great. Yes, sorry, I think we are out of time. Thank you very much for your time. I hope you guys enjoyed it. And thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Mona. Thank you, Julia.